I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke chapter 10. Don't know who left their water on stage. Wasn't but me. If I, if I leave it there, I'll drink it, and that's not a good thing. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue our series called uh, Just Jesus, where we're talking about practical wisdom right now. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab uh, one of the Bibles that are in the seats around you. Turn to page 1105, and you will find Luke chapter 10. Hey, while you're turning there, let me tell you about a great opportunity for some of you. Uh, if you're a follower of Christ and you have yet to be baptized, you've never declared publicly as a follower of Christ that, that Jesus is your Savior to the world, we've got a couple of really special opportunities coming up. Now, truth is, if you want to get baptized, uh, we will baptize you anywhere, anytime, as long as there's water and people. So, uh, I mean, that's kind of our, our thing. But, but next week, uh, we're going to be worshiping in our new Sweetwater facility. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's kind of exciting. And, and, um, and so we're going to be worshiping there. We're going to be dedicating that facility to Christ and his work. And if you want to dedicate your life to him and declare that to the world, then please, uh, before you leave today, stop by the greeting room, which is back over here where it says parenting room. Uh, find Pastor Chet and just say, hey, I want to get baptized next week. Uh, we would love to do that. It'd be such a, a fun thing. Now, the other opportunity that you have is every year we do a big lake baptism. Uh, we're going to do that on June the 5th this year, uh, down and have, just have a baptism party. And if you want to declare your faith uh, in Christ to the world, when a lot of them don't know him, then uh, just email us, call us, let us know that you want to be on that list. And we would love to help you be obedient to Jesus. Now, that said, happy Mother's Day to everyone that applies to. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's right. Happy Mother's Day. And, and uh, we're so glad you're here on Mother's Day. And, and I just want to confess, I'm not a mom. Okay? In case there was any, any questions about that, I, I have a mom. Uh, I'm married to a mom. I raised a mom, but I'm not one. So I thought, hey, it's Mother's Day. We're looking at a passage. It's about women. I'm going to get some help from a godly mom that I respect to help me preach this passage. And so I've asked Julie Garnis, who is our director of children's ministry. You may have seen her before. Hi. Uh, to... Uh, to kind of help me with the sermon today, uh, so it would be good. Uh, oh, yeah. Anyway, Luke chapter 10, uh, verses 38 through 42 is what we're looking at. Now, by the way, we're looking at a passage about these two ladies named Mary and Martha. They're sisters. And this is kind of their introduction to us because they're prominent in the Gospels. They're kind of famous. Uh, you know, they had a brother named Lazarus who got raised from the dead, John chapter 11. Uh, Mary anointed Jesus with really costly perfume right before he was crucified. So uh, they're kind of prominent, uh, but this is our first introduction to them, and they have something really to teach us. Actually, Jesus has something to teach us from their lives. It says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Uh, I want you to know that today, Jesus wants to challenge our priorities. Jesus wants to challenge our priorities. In other words, he wants to challenge your priorities and my priorities, how we order our life, how we structure our life, how we think about our lives. And that's what this passage really calls us to look at. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, it is your natural desire then to please your Savior. I mean, we kind of want to do what God wants us to do, right? That's kind of what's built into saying Jesus is my Lord. But stuff gets in the way. Things get in the way from us following Jesus the way we want to. And so today, uh, we want to talk to not just moms, but to everybody about those things that get in the way. And this one thing that is the priority. Uh, now, one thing that gets in the way, and we see it in this text, is expectations and distractions get in the way of us following Jesus. Julie, you want to talk about that? Yes, I do. This, there's only four verses that we're looking at, but there is so much more to it, especially when you understand what the culture of the first century woman was like. 
It's changed just a little bit. <laughs> just a little. Let me tell you about it. Women were basically given their role or their social status by who their daddy was or who they married. They were one step above property. Back then, a rabbi's prayer would go something like this. Dear God, thank you that I am not a Gentile, a dog, or a woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you men better not laugh. You're going to get the elbow. <laughs> The truth is, then and now, we are crushed under the expectations, the pressure of expectations that other around, the others around us put on us, or our mothers or fathers or brothers or sisters. As a mother, I often am crushed by the expectations of what I like to call the mom jury. You know, those people, they're either real or imaginary, and they take tabs on your life. Like, hmm, is she making her own baby food or is that a baby jar I see in her diaper bag? <laughs> Negative 10. Or, oh, the birthday invitations that she made matches the actual birthday party, plus 10. <laughs> there are all these things that we can keep tabs on as mothers. And sometimes that makes us feel like failures because the expectations are up here and it's not real realistic to get there. Raise your hand if you've ever felt like a failure, men or women. Okay, some of you haven't, but... Let's talk after service so you can teach me Let's be really what I'm doing wrong. There was a day in particular that I will never forget, and some of you may have heard me talk about this. It was the day I gave myself the Mother of the Year Award. When my son, my son was turning one year old, and I wanted to give him a great party. So I took him to the grocery store, and we loaded up with groceries and party decorations at what, used to, what was the first Albertsons. I was walking to the car, and I loaded him in the car and put him in his car seat and put all of my groceries in the trunk. And I also put my keys in the trunk, and I shut the door. I locked my son and my keys in the car in 90-degree weather. My little boy was just turning one, and I still thank the Lord that he was sleeping when this happened, but he was sweating and sleeping, and I was screaming my face off, asking for help. People came quickly. And they called AAA. AAA showed up within minutes, which was really awesome. He unlocked my car, and I quickly, like, I, I seriously just opened that back door, and I hugged my son. I love you. I'll never do this again. <laughs> and I set my keys in the car again and shut the door. And I locked it again. At this point, <laughs> AAA had already left, and they were driving down McCulloch, and I ran out in front of that truck. And I did. <laughs> Excuse me, it's me again, this way. And he went like this. <laughs> so he helped me again unlock the car, and he didn't leave until <laughs> I was in that seat. That's why we all have keys for Julie's cars. <laughs> yeah, because it hasn't stopped. I judged myself so harshly that day, and I still do, and I was reminded a few months ago of this event when one of my friends, Christy Brown, she's here today, aren't you? <laughs> she, she emailed me, or Facebook messaged me a little while ago and said, Miss Julie, uh, today I locked my keys in the car, and I called AAA, and they came and helped me, and I said, this must have been the stupidest thing you've ever seen. And he said, actually, <laughs> there... <laughs> About seven years ago, there was this chick at Albertsons. Yeah. My story right there. Failure as a mother. The truth is, I'm sure you do too, but we judge ourselves so harshly. So harshly sometimes that we forget what Jesus says about us. You know, uh, we, not, we need to understand God's expectations for us. Because, uh, as Julie mentioned so well, we, we have all these false expectations that other people have put on us, and a lot of times those will crush us. And so the, the reality is God doesn't expect uh, perfection from us, even though a lot of us act like he does. God expects us to improve. Improvement, not perfection. And, and uh, in fact, let me just tell you what Scripture says his expectations of us are. Jesus said, love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor 
as yourself. In fact, he says everything else is pretty much summarized by these two statements. Love God, love others. The Apostle Paul put it um, beautifully in Ephesians 2.10. By the way, some of you need to write that verse down. You need to copy it out, put it all over your house because you need to be reminded of this truth. Paul says, for we are God's workmanship. His, his artwork, his masterpieces. We're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. In, in other words, God thinks you're awesome. He, he thinks you're beautiful. He thinks you're wonderful. And, and, he, and he wants you to be the man or woman that he created you to be. That's it. He doesn't want you to try to be like someone else and try to be, you know, have their attributes or their skills or their abilities or their talents or anything else. He just wants you to be you. And when you are, are being the, the man or woman that God created you to be, then it's so natural for you to do the things that God created you to do. And, and so, you know, take some of those, that pressure uh, that we put on ourselves of these crazy expectations and, and just embrace the grace of God and knowing that he loves you like you are and he just wants to see you to, to improve, not to be perfect. Because there's not one of us that are perfect. We're not perfect parents. We're not perfect spouses. We're not perfect Christians. It just, that's not reality. So don't let the expectations get in the way of you following Jesus. Now, the other thing that gets in the way is the distractions, okay? Uh, Martha was distracted by the tasks, right? There she is. She's serving, and Jesus is there. I mean, guest of honor. Talk about really the guest of honor, and she wants everything to be perfect, so she's serving, and, and she looks over, and her sister is sitting on the floor listening to Jesus, and it just irritates her. You guys have never been irritated because you were working and somebody else wasn't, have you? Uh, never, uh, never been there, have you? Okay. Huh. Hey, any of you ever been judged because you were the one sitting on the floor while somebody else was working? Yeah. So, so Martha, she, get, she just gets upset, and she goes to Jesus and complains, Jesus, don't you care that my sister, this lazy sister, is sitting on her butt in here, and she needs to get up and come in the kitchen and help me? I don't think you None said that. None of us but. have ever said that. <laughs> My interpretation, okay? okay. Little, little freedom. <laughs> I've heard you do children's time. Hey. Now. And so, and Jesus just says to her, um, Martha, no. You're, you're just freaking out over all these tasks that you think are important. But your sister actually understands the thing that's really important. You see, Jesus rebuked Martha for valuing tasks over relationship. He affirmed Mary in the fact that she was focused on having a relationship with him, a relationship with the living God. And he said, she's got it figured out. I'm not going to rebuke her for doing the right thing. And so we get distracted by all the stuff on our to-do list and all these things that we have to take care of, and it gets in the way of our relationship with the living God. Uh, so let's do something that might be fun or it might start some fights. I don't know. Uh, are you more like Mary or are you more like Martha? In your own world, in your own life, would you identify more with Mary or would you identify more with Martha? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell the person sitting next to you uh, whether you're more like Mary or more like Martha. And you can even give yourself a percentage if you want to. Oh, boy. And then you can see if they agree with you. Uh, I already and, see them uh, looking at so, each other awkwardly. So you only have a few seconds, so ready, set, go. <laughs> oh, yeah. <clears throat> you know, oh, they're really this, getting into this. This might be one of the favorite questions we've ever asked. I see you know. pointing fingers going on. Yeah, counseling is available after the service. Uh, <laughs> okay, no more talking. Listen up. <laughs> Just kidding. You can finish it up. You have five seconds. You can continue the conversation okay. over lunch. Yeah. So whenever I hear the story of Mary and Martha, I tend to relate people in my life that are Martha-ish or Mary-ish. Do you guys think of that too, people that fit that category? When I was growing up, I had a best friend in high school, and her mom was very Martha-ish. We would go over to her house to hang out, and the second you'd stepped into her house, it was like you were uncomfortably 
um, in a cleanliness. Like you, you couldn't breathe or sneeze or move. She had her carpet so very properly vacuumed that there were parallel lines across the whole thing every time. So whenever she left the room, <laughs> I'd go across it like this. And then we'd go hang out, and a few minutes later, you'd hear the vacuum start up. <laughs> I w God was using me to teach her a lesson. Yeah. Either that or you're just yeah. cruel. <laughs> or I mean, she was also the type of person that if we have sleepovers, she would make your bed while you were still sleeping <laughs> in the morning. She was a really, really great person, though. She was just really into serving all the time. Then we have the Mary, who I think of, which is my mommy, 100%. And if you know my mommy, you're like, yeah. She values relationships over anything else, and especially her relationship with Jesus, which I was blessed to grow up with, waking up in the morning, seeing her Bible open. She, that still is a priority to her. Uh, when I would bring friends over to my house, our house wasn't always the cl cleanest thing in the whole world. <laughs> but she was the first one to throw the laundry off the couch and tell everyone to come in and sit down and hang out. <laughs> my husband is not laughing right now because now I'm like that. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I go back and forth. But my, my dad and both my husband tend to be that Martha-ish because they have to balance us out. Balance is really important in this it, discussion, it isn't is. it? It is. Hey, by the way, how many of you uh, are more like Martha? Let's go ahead and confess. Yeah, a lot of hands go up. How many are more like Mary? Not nearly as many hands in any, any service. And uh, it's funny because we talked about this in our staff, and most of us lean toward the, the Martha side, like pretty heavily, like we need to repent kind of heavily. <laughs> And, uh, and it's not good because, as Julie just said, our lives need balance. In fact, Jesus calls us to a life of balance. Uh, and, and, and that means we build a deep relationship with Jesus and we serve him. Because here's what happens. When our life gets out of balance, we tend to fall. We, we tend to crash. Our life gets broken when we get out of balance. Uh, and, and so that deep relationship with Jesus has got to be a part of that life, and serving has got to be part of that life. And uh, it, it's awesome to sit at the feet of Jesus, to do that one thing. But a lot of us uh, have only got that half right. In other words, we're really good at sitting. We sit in the pew, we sit on our couch, we sit in the stands and watch other people do, and we applaud, and we go, that's great. But... Um, it's not just sitting, it's sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning from him. Now, I, I say that, but there, there's also this part that, um, well, how do I put this? A lot of churches love unbalanced people, especially if they're unbalanced like Martha. Uh, because if you're a Martha and you love to serve, then there's churches that once you volunteer, they will just keep piling stuff on you and give you more responsibility, and, more, and they won't give you the help. They'll just give you more stuff to do until the day that you burn out and then they'll judge you for quitting. Oh, you're just a quitter, huh? They'll question your commitment. And, and, uh, and that's a tragedy. In fact, there's some of you that I'm pretty sure are sitting here right now that that's your story. You were someplace else, and they wore you out, burned you out, and you're like, I'm never volunteering again. And I just want you to know that that is not what we do here at Calvary. We value our volunteers, and so if you volunteer for ministry, if you're serving in a ministry, whatever it is, and you start feeling overwhelmed, you start feeling burned out, you start feeling tired, we want you to tell your ministry leader because they're not going to judge you. They want to help you. They want to heal you. They want to build your life. Excuse not... me. <laughs> I'm feeling really tired and burned out. Is this a good time to talk about it? or? Well, uh... you know, maybe staff meeting tomorrow might be a great time. Okay. Uh, we can talk about that great. then. Great. Uh, I, but, I do uh, have by to. By the way, admit, I, I do know that. <laughs> okay, where are you burned out to? We'll uh, talk tomorrow. Okay, thank you. I do have to admit something though. I was one of those people in the staff meeting that raised their hand and said, "I have a Martha problem," especially lately. Actually, especially since I came on staff and into ministry, I had a very wrong impression of what ministry was, and it's been clarified. Good thing. I have to admit something. Um, when I first started children's ministry, you probably didn't see me very much up here, like in service. I was always with the kids. 
because that was my ministry. I was going to teach it. I was going to be the face they see every single week because they need consistency, right? And then I was also pushing our volunteers and staff, make sure you're going to a service every weekend. You need to get fed. And then I got a little tap on my shoulder. Hey, you. <laughs> you're telling everyone else what to do and you're not doing it yourself, sister. I'm like, ooh, yeah, they're right. So they rebuked me in a nice-ish way. Actually, they just told me what to do. <laughs> Go to a service once a week. Spread it out. Go to something with your husband and your family because we don't want you to burn out. And then some people that were really, really good friends even said, you know what, I'm actually going to take your place while you're up there and you don't have to worry about a thing. So from now on, when I'm hanging out in service with you guys, can you stop looking at me like this? <laughs> what are you doing up here? Who's taking care of our kids? I always say, oh, they're fine. They're just running around. That's not the truth. We have a really great team of people that Amen. love your kids yes. and love Jesus, and they're there hanging out. We have a great team, so you never have to worry and stop giving me bad looks. <laughs> Let me tell you something, though. I had to realize something, and I hope some of you realize this today, too. Jesus doesn't love you or me because of what you do. He loves you because of who you are. Yeah. and who he created you to be. When our life is unbalanced, we tend to fall, yeah. and that is the truth. Yeah. And the only way that we can really lead a balanced life is to intentionally follow Jesus. And Jesus wants to be our priority. Jesus wants to be your priority. That means he wants to be the center of our lives, not just a piece of our life. He wants to be in the middle. He wants everything to revolve around him. He wants to be the heart of it all. And so if you're just getting honest with God, you know, is Jesus what your life revolves around or is he just part of your life? And, and see, he wants to be that which influences your values, your decisions, your, your social life, everything. He wants to be the one thing that drives your life. So uh, have you given Jesus authority over your priorities? You know, when we say he's Lord, that means he's boss, he's master, and he gets to decide for us. But um, is he really in that role in your life? So uh, we've all learned to say that God is most important in our lives. If you were like me and you grew up in church and, and uh, you heard people talk about putting God first, and so you learned, like, the response, you know, and I, I learned growing up, I'm supposed to say, if somebody says, what are your priorities, you know, God's first, and family second, and if you're really getting specific, you know, your, your marriage is second, your kids are third, you know, then you got to work, and, and then church, you know, that kind of stuff. Now, we said that, we learned that, we could, you know, say the words, but then here's what happens. We all walk out the door, and we live our priorities. It doesn't matter what you say they are, you actually live out what's important to you. You and I live our priorities. We can't hide them. Um, it, it just, it, it's reality. So Jesus wants to challenge our priorities today. Uh, so what does it mean to put Jesus first? Uh, some of you are kind of like in that state of shock going, wait a minute, you mean I'm supposed to love Jesus more than I love my, my spouse, more than I love my kids, more than I love my grandkids? Are you serious? Yes. Jesus wants you to love him more. Because the reality is this, the, if you love God more than you love your spouse, you're going to be a better husband or wife. He's going to enable you to love better. Uh, we were kind of newlyweds, uh, hadn't been married very long, and I told Merelda one day something that I thought was romantic and theologically true. Uh, I, I learned that day you shouldn't mix the two, probably. Because yeah. um, I said to her, honey, uh, I can't live without Jesus, and I don't want to live without you. And she was not impressed at that point in time. <laughs> she did not find that heartfelt that I love Jesus more than her. Now, she completely gets it now. In fact, now she wants me to go hang out with God. She wants me to spend time with Jesus because she knows that if I'm loving Jesus more than her, when I come home, I am a much better husband. Mm -hmm. I am a much better father and grandfather when I spend time with Jesus. Why? Because Scripture says love is patient, love is kind. I am kinder when I'm hanging out with God. I am more patient when I'm spending time with Jesus, when I love him more than my wife. And she likes the patient, kind Chad. Mm -hmm. We all do. Yeah. 
And, and that's true. That's true for all of us. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and, and so that's why we ought to love Jesus more than we love our spouse. You know, that was a total joke. Yes, I do. Okay. Okay. Because you are always patient and kind, I promise. <laughs> See, it, it doesn't so. just work for morale. It works for everybody when I hang out with Jesus. I would like to relate this to children. Uh, Brandon and I are not the perfect parents, which those of you that are close friends with us, you're going, oh, yeah, you're not. But we take, uh, we take the communication with our kids seriously about this matter. We've tried from the very beginning to let them know that we love Jesus actually more than you, but it helps us be a better mommy and daddy. And about two years ago, Sawyer, and we try to live that, by the way, Two years ago, Sawyer, we were putting him to bed, my little eight-year-old son, and he said, Mommy, is it okay that I love Jesus more than you? And I said, Yes, absolutely it is. And then, last night, when I was putting Layla to bed and tucking her in, she said, Mommy, I love you more than anything in the whole world. And in the back of my head, I thought, Oh, I have failed. Because I want her to grasp that, right? But then, like, two seconds later, she said, Except for God, I love him more. Yeah. Yay! So she got it. Takes a while, but my encouragement to you is start that as soon as you can. It's never too late, but start those conversations as soon as you can with your kids. Hey, we want to want to close by getting really practical. Uh, because if Jesus is our priority and and we want to give him that authority over our lives and what's important, uh, we want to challenge you by just uh, mentioning some areas that you and God may want to have a conversation about, that you, that you want to uh, kind of say, hey, is my life really measuring up to where God wants it to be in these areas? So here's just some, some places where you want to do some evaluation. First of all, is your time given to God? By the way, these aren't in your notes, but if you're taking notes, you may want to write these down. Uh, is your time given to God? Are you sitting at the feet of Jesus? And by that we mean, are you spending time in prayer? Besides, you know, at mealtime and asking God to condemn people that cut you off. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, that's, that's a prayer, by the way. I don't know if you realize that. Um, but are you spending time in prayer? Are you spending time reading the Bible? You know, we give Bibles away because we want you to read God's Word. It's wisdom. It'll shape your life. It'll tell you how to live. Are, are you spending time in worship? Not just that one hour on Sundays, but throughout the week, are you celebrating God's goodness in your life? Are you spending time in a life group where other believers are encouraging you to walk with God and apply his wisdom to your life? In other words, if you looked at your schedule, is God a priority with your time? Another area to evaluate is, are you leading your family to Jesus? This is something that we are asked to do. And we need to take it very seriously. Here are some ways that you can lead your family to Jesus. I, when you say life groups, I think about that, especially since some of my life group peeps are here today. But when we go to life group and we bring our children and our families, they see us as putting Jesus as a priority, our relationship with him. And they actually look forward to it, sometimes more than we do, because we have things we need to do sometimes. But they love it, and they get to see that. Another thing is make sure that you're setting aside a prayer time with your family every day, whether that's in the morning before you go to school, get in a quick circle, say a little prayer, um, before you go to, the kids go to bed, even in the living room, at, at their bed, get on your knees, pray together. And if you don't know how to pray, it's all right. All it is is talking to God. And that teaching that to your children right away is a really good idea too. And that one more thing is the way we impact our community. I think of Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, we, we were able to serve Jamaica, and we brought our kids with us. And they serve the teachers too. When they see you serving, it makes them want to serve at the same time and put Jesus first. Um, as there was one more point I was going to say, and I forgot. Oh, you forgot. Maybe yeah. coming to church, bringing your uh, kids to church. Yeah. Sure. The, uh, oh, the Rasmussen's. There's okay. a family that's been bringing their kid to Sweetwater as we try to set up the rooms. She's one year old. She doesn't help at all. <laughs> but she, she sees what's going on. She sees she is, she is her learning. family leading. Hey, let me just uh, jump on and add to this because uh, I'm passionate about this. I was in youth, youth ministry for 10 years before uh, becoming a senior pastor. And, uh, and, and so I, I share this from a youth pastor's heart, but also from a pastor's heart. Parents, uh, look for those opportunities to influence your kids in significant ways. 
Um, we offer life-changing opportunities. And, and now every week it, it's significant. You bring your kids to church, that's great. But uh, we offer those intensives, you know, and we call them things like youth camp and adventure for the city camp and, you know, the 5-6 camp. We, we call them mission trips. And, and these need to be priorities for you as parents because sometimes your kids want to go and sometimes they don't. And, and uh, look, I am all for, you know, uh, band camp and sports camp and cheer camp and all that kind of stuff. Those are great opportunities. But do you value those more than God camp? You see, I, I think God wants at least to be as important. And, uh, and if you're saying, well, it's all about finances, then, you know, what are you going to invest in? Because what's really going to impact their lives long term? And, uh, and I, I, just, I just can't help but do that because I've seen parents that, that come to us when their families are broken apart because their kids are wandering far from God, and they're the, a lot of times the ones that never sent their kids to anything. And, and I'm just saying, this is, a, this is a value that you get to lean into it by encouraging them and making a priority. And don't let money get in the way because, you know, we don't ever let that be an excuse. We're, we're willing to help because we believe in these opportunities. Grandparents, if you're a grandparent in this room, I'm going to talk to you because I'm a grandparent now. I can throw down smack. Here it is. <laughs> he said smack. If, if, you got, if you got grandkids and, and you've got influence in their lives, then, you know, you can encourage them to go to camps. You can take them on mission trips. And here's the thing. Don't let money be get in the way. You just put the money where your mouth is and you offer to pay for their camps. You just say, hey, look, I'm not going to let that stand in the way. If your kids need help, then you help them out by sending the grandkids to camp. Take the grandkids on a mission trip with you. I know that means some of you have to go on a mission trip too, but that's okay. We'll take you. Because these are moments when God can interrupt their lives and have a lifelong impact. And you know we're all about life change. And I'll stop ranting now so that Julie can talk again. Okay. So another area to evaluate is are we giving God our abilities? Some of us struggle with, oh, I'm not good at anything or... I can't help with sweet water. There's nothing I can do there. I'm not gifted. Can I tell you something? We are all, we all have been given gifts. God given gifts and abilities that we can use and be vessels for him to help change our community and the lives of our family. And um, I want to talk particularly about the children's ministry. Imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> I've had these conversations even recent. And I hear, can you really use my help? Do you think I'd really be able to help? But I'm old. Listen up, all you people that call yourselves old. You're not too old to help. Some of these kids don't have grandparents. And some of them live far away, so they don't have that connection anymore. You are, you are very valued. Teenagers, high schoolers, I'm not good enough to work with kids. They love you. You're crazier than I am. They love you. You are valued if you like children. If you don't like children, don't come around. <laughs> to children's but ministry. To the children's ministry. <laughs> Let me clarify. And, you know, we're expecting growth. We're expecting and praying for people to come to Sweetwater so that they can hear about Jesus. But with growth comes more families. With more families come more children. And with more children, we, we do need some more help and volunteers in the children's department. So look at your um, brochures. What are they called again? <laughs> Bulletins? Bulletins. <laughs> look your bulletins and look for my email and email me up if you're interested in helping with the kiddos. Yeah. We value you. And, and realize that, that what Julie said is really insightful because the whole reason we built Sweetwater Facility is so that we can have an impact on the 40,000 unchurched people in Lake Havasu City. And, and that's the why. And so if God answers our prayer, he's going to send us more families and that means more people that that need life groups and more people that, that need serving. And we need you guys to, to help because you already, you already get it. And a lot of you are qualified and capable, and um, you just need to talk with God about whether he has your abilities and you can use them to impact people's lives in his name. Um, last thing that uh, we want to mention for evaluation, do a priority check. Does Jesus have uh, authority over your money and finances? Uh, because the fastest way to reveal what your priorities really are is what you spend your money on. Uh, the average American church-going evangelical, which qualifies as us, the people who actually go to church on a regular basis, give God 2.5% of their income. 2.5%. Now, if you know anything at all, you know God asks for 10%. 
and that is a long way from two and a half to ten. I don't know whether you're above average, below average, uh, whatever. Uh, it, 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 that doesn't matter to me because I already mentioned God doesn't expect perfection. He expects improvement. Is, is your priority toward God financially growing? In other words, are you walking in the right direction in terms of your financial commitments to God so that he is becoming more and more a priority in your life? Uh, that's something that you and God should talk about. One more thing as, as we kind of bring this to a close. Remember, next week we're going to be at a new location, and that's really cool. Uh, we've been aiming for this for a long time. Same service times, so 11 o'clock at Sweetwater, same worship, you know, staff leading you. Uh, everything else will be different. It'll feel different, it'll look different, and here's the thing, you're going to love some of those differences, <laughs> you're probably going to loathe some of those differences. I don't know. But here's what I want you to know. All of the stuff we're doing is because our priority as Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. That's our priority. We're not going to give any ground on that priority because that's what drives us. We figured that out. We're going to surrender to Christ at that. He's got authority over our priorities. We're comfortable with that. But today, have you given Jesus authority over your priorities? We pray that you can answer yes because we know that a life out of balance is going to fall. And we don't want you to crash. Let's pray together.